It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce Carol Fierke, a great scientist and inspiring mentor and the winner of the 2020 Mildred Cohen Award. This award was established to honor the accomplishments and spirit of the late Professor Mildred Cohen. Mildred overcame tremendous bigotry with brilliance and determination. She was a real pioneer for women in science. She started college when she was just 15, majoring in chemistry when chemistry was an unladylike profession. She graduated three years later, joined a doctoral program at Columbia, but was barred from even TA positions because of her gender. And after graduation, she was unable to even get interviews with large chemical companies because they explicitly only allowed male applicants. This, despite her having done pioneering work on radioactive isotopes under the direction of a Nobel laureate, Harold Urey, one, by the way, of four Nobel laureates that she worked either with or under. It seems like these smart people recognized her brilliance, even if society did not initially accept it. She was the first woman appointed to the board of JBC and later served as the first woman president of the American Society of Biological Chemistry, the precursor of ASBMB. Like Dr. Cohen, Dr. Fierke has also been a pioneer. Carol's work has provided clear insights into how catalysts achieve high efficiency without sacrificing specificity. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that she's the world's expert on metalloenzymes. The project that began her career was the fundamental study of the determinants of metal selectivity and affinity of carb or carbonic anhydrase. She used her knowledge of protein metal binding to redesign carbonic anhydrase as a fluorescent biosensor for measuring and imaging readily exchangeable metal ions in cells. Her work led to the conclusion that free metals are actually present in vanishingly small, namely picomolar concentrations in vivo. Dr. Firke's group has made groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of the catalytic mechanism and substrate specificity specificity of metalloenzymes. And she's certainly the go-to person whenever I had questions about metals in biology. Her contributions are too numerous to list. She's published 414 papers and she's been cited over 16,000 times. Her work is not showy, but deep and rigorous and her interpretations are conservative. Carol has been an exceptional mentor, not just to people in her laboratory, and the broader university and scientific community as well. I think she approaches mentorship with the same vigor and rigor that she attacks scientific problems. Carol has inspired generations of graduate students in her laboratory and is the chair of the Department of Chemistry here at Michigan and later as the Dean of the Rackham Graduate School and Pro Vice Provost here. Sadly for us at Michigan, Carol was recruited to Texas A&M in 2017 where she served as provost until early this year when she was recruited back to Brandeis, the place she earned her PhD back in 1984, where she's currently serving as provost. We're excited to hear about her recent work on tools to evaluate biological function of histone deacetylases, based, I'm presuming, on one of the half dozen papers she published in 2020 during the height of COVID and despite her numerous administrative duties. Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here to be able to describe to you some of the work that my laboratory has done on evaluating the substrate specificity and function of histone deacetylases. To begin with, I would like to really be very thankful for receiving the Mildred Cohn Award. Mildred Cohn was power new, pioneered the use of NMR to determine how enzymes and other proteins behave during chemical reactions in the body. She was the first female president of ASBMB and also had many other firsts. I had the pleasure of a meeting Mildred once and certainly she has inspired me and many other uh, women scientists over the years. So thank you very much, Mildred, for inspiring this award. Thank you very much, ASBMB and the awards committee for uh, selecting me for this award. I am very honored to be amongst the um, 
select group who have won this award. I'd like to thank Jim Bardwell and the other people who nominated for me for this award and my colleagues at Michigan, Texas A&M and Brandeis. Thank you. I would also like to um, make a thank you to the most important legacy, which is the coworkers who have worked in my lab over the years, the graduate students, undergraduate students and postdoctoral fellows. They are my most important legacy, and I am very proud of the work that they are carrying out. Today, I'd like to talk to you about our work with histone deacetylases. My lab has been very interested in understanding um, post-translational modifications and how they regulate protein structure, function, localization, and how um, the enzymes that uh, catalyze these reactions recognize which enzymes to modify. These post-translational uh, modifications are very important for enhancing the um, diversity of the proteome relative to the transcriptome and to the genome. So this is, these are very important um, reactions. So lysine, acetyl lysine acetyl acetylation is the second most common um, post-translational modification. And today we, I'm gonna talk about the metal-dependent histone deacetylases. And in this case, an acetyl group is added directly to uh, an N-acetyl lysine, and, and, uh, added directly to a lysine group to form an N-acetyl lysine using acetyl-CoA as a substrate. And then the enzymes that I, we study, the histone deacetylases, hydrolyze that to give you back the lysine and uh, acetate. Um, acetylation alters protein function and protein-protein interactions. And in general, it's associated with activation of transcription. It was called, they've been called histone deacetylases because the, the histones are highly acetylated. However, as you'll see that they actually are large number of proteins that are acetylated in uh, the human genome, and therefore they should really be called um, uh, lysine deacetylases or acetyl lysine deacetylases. Lysine acetylation has been identified in more than 7,000 proteins in the mammalian proteome, and they are in all areas of the biological function from cell cycle to ribosome to cytoskeletal remodeling. So one of the big questions in the field is, how are these proteins recognized so that they're both acetylated and deacetylated under biological conditions? There are um, 11, 11 enzymes, 11 isozymes of the metal-dependent HDACs um, of three classes, one, two, and four, and there are seven NAD-dependent enzymes, the certain one to seven, which is class three. We are gonna focus on the metal dependent HDACs today. Global loss of any of the class one HDACs is lethal in mice. Um, the in vivo roles, regulation and substrate specificity of individual HDAC isozymes are not yet well understood. One of the enzymes that my lab has uh, focused on is histone deacetylase eight which is one of the smallest enzymes and is one of the enzymes that is perhaps thought to not work in large complexes. Mouse knockout of HDAC8 leads to perinatal death and brain trauma. It's been shown to be important for cell contractility and cytoskeleton. It is localized to both the cytosol and the nucleus. Missense mutations in HDAC8 lead to a Cornelia delaying like syndrome, which leads to facial malformations and mental retardation. And there's good evidence that HDAC8 deacetylates de SMC3 within the cohesin complex. And that is what leads to um, these uh, Bio, biological changes in the children who have um, these missense mutations. So SMC3 has been the, is the best demonstrated substrate for HDAC8 and other substrates are less clear and that that's one of the questions that we're working on answering. 
So today I'm really gonna talk about two things. One is use the types of tools we have looked at for determining substrate selectivity of HDAC8 using motif identification and substrate capture. And then I'll end by looking at regulation of HDAC1 activity by protein partners. So one of the ways to identify substrates is by looking for um, motif identification, what amino acids are recognized by HDAC8. We started this work as a collaboration with Milan Merck6 group to do a mass spectrometry assay of a peptide library where we varied one amino acid at a time. And you can see the data here. And the data suggests that in the Z position, uh, aromatic amino acids are well recognized. However, this was certainly not sufficient to be able to go from uh, to, to be able to identify in vivo proteins. So we then worked with um, a, a computational group, Aura schuler Furman, to use the FlexPEP bind protocol to identify perhaps a better algorithm to look for uh, possible substrates. Um, we use training sets of the MERSIC library and other peptide libraries, and we um, worked with the um, Aura schuler Furman's group to predict and rank the acetylated peptides, looking at binding energy and optimizing the peptide starting structure. To this end, we then um, took a number of peptides with different um, activities different peptide scores from the algorithm and actually measured the activity. And we found that the good peptides actually had good activities. Um, and then the bad peptides also had low activities, but even better, we found that there was a correlation between log K cat over KM and the peptide score as shown on this slide. And that suggested that we actually might be able to use this algorithm to um, suggest uh, proteins. So what we learned from this, from these data was that HDAC8 does display local sequence preferences as observed in peptide selectivity. We also, in other experiments I'm not gonna talk about today, learned that um, HDAC8 reactivity with peptide with proteins are in fact much larger than with peptides, showing that there are also long range protein protein interactions that lead to selectivity. We've demonstrated that the algorithm is useful for identifying potential deacetylation sites in proteins. And we use this to identify a couple of proteins that we would predict are good substrates, for instance, elongation factor 1-alpha-1, uh, the CAD protein, and the zinc finger protein uh, 318. So from this, we felt we learned a, a significant amount about um, the substrate selectivity, but we wanted to move on to use a different method. And in this method, we uh, have worked on a covalent substrate capture method. In this method, we prepared HDAC8 that contains a single amino acid photocrosslinker, parabenzamyl l alanine, and we put this crosslinker at three different sites um, that are relatively near the active site, and particularly tyrosine 100 is right at the active site. We then use this to crosslink, um, H we put HDAC8 into cell lysates, and cross-linked the, them with the protein and pulled down the HDAC8. And then finally, we did protein identification using mass spectrometry. So this slide shows our, an anti-HDAC8 Western blot in comparing um, the wild type and the um, BPA modified proteins and showing that we get significantly more cross-linked proteins with the BPA protein once it has been UV irradiated. So we then took the cross-link proteins, um, digested with trypsin and carried out LC-MS-MS analysis to identify the bound protein. What we, after doing the mass spectrometry, we needed to do uh, in, have high stringency. And so we compared 
um, the data we got from cells that, from lysates that were um, cross-linked, so that's the UV dependent enrichment to the cell, the lysates that were not UV uh, irradiated. We also used a p-value and a, a number of uh, other stringent characteristics characteristics. So we then looked in that upper right quadrant and tried to identify what were those proteins. And this is a summary of what we found. In fact, you can see we looked at three sites. The Y100 site is actually very close to the peptide. Um, the other two sites, I94 and, y1, and, and F191, are a little farther away. And what we found is we got a large number of proteins cross-linking to the Y100 site, about 120. And um, when we looked in the uh, phospho database, we found that 90%, more than 90% of the these identified proteins are acetylated, suggesting that in fact, these are likely to be uh, substrates of HDAC8. The other two sites, we actually found a small number of proteins. Um, and when we looked at the sequences around the acetyl lysine, the predicted acetyl lysine, we did find that um, aromatic amino acids were preferred. So to try to test whether these um, proteins could in fact be uh, HDAC8 substrates, we took peptides from them and measured the reactivity with peptides. And for a majority of them, we were able to see that these peptides were better than SMC3, comparable or better than SMC3. And when we looked at the peptide scores and measured, compared that to the log K caliber KM, we found that our algorithm describes the reactivity of HDAC8 with these putative in vivo substrates. So what, with our substrate capture, what we found was that cross-linking followed by our mass spectromatic analysis, we identified about 110 acetylated proteins that cross-link with the active site of HDAC8 and have shown that these are likely substrates for HDAC8. Um, we've also shown that acetylated peptides from these proteins react with HDAC8 in vitro as predicted by the algorithm. And so in summary, this shows that this is in fact a very general method that one can use to identify weak protein-protein complexes. And we think that in fact, it has done a really good job of identifying putative HDAC8 substrates. So with that, I'm gonna move on to talk about um, uh, the question of what, how do binding partners affect the activity and selectivity of HDAC8, of HDACs in general. So what you see on this slide is you can see that, in fact, many of the HDACs have been identified that they have a large number of protein interactions, um, particularly HDACs 1 and 2 have been identified that they could have over 600 um, protein interactions. And it's been shown that these interactions play a large role in a, a variety of different biological functions with gene expression being the highest. So with HDAX one through three, they form uh, multiple stable complexes and the stable complexes make it much easier to actually look at the effect of these proteins. And so this seemed like a good way to begin answering the question about how do protein binding partners affect activity and selectivity. And in particular, we have focused on the CORES complex, which is one of the simplest. The CORES complex includes a CORES, which is a co-repressor, and LSD1, which is a demethylase, and either or both HDAX1 and 2. And so our question is, is what is the role of CORES and LSD1 in determining HDAC1 activity and selectivity? And we wanted to test this by reconstituting the complex and measuring the effects of these proteins on the HDAC1 activity. So we started by um, recombinantly expressing HDAC1 and um, comparing the activity that we got to a commercially available enzyme, which is actually not 100% pure. 
So we started with expressing the enzyme in E. coli. And what you can see by the purple color is in fact, the activity with peptides of the E. coli express enzyme was very low. We then went to insect cells um, and expressed the activity and measured, expressed the enzyme in insect cells and measured the reactivity. What you can see is the activity is higher in insect cells, but not equal to the commercially available enzyme. Furthermore, what we know about the insect cell enzyme is that in fact, it's phosphorylated, whereas the E. coli enzyme isn't. So to try to see if the difference between the insect cell and the E. coli enzyme was due to phosphorylation, we created a phosphomimic mutation in E. coli that contains um, uh, two uh, glutamate mutations uh, to try to mimic the phosphate site. And as you can see, none of the enzyme in the E. coli had significant activity. So we then wanted to ask the question of, is this just a problem with activity on peptides? Or so what happens to the observed activity when we use uh, proteins? So in this case, we used um, singly acetylated histone H3, which again, we made by incorporation of non-cognate amino acids. And what you can see here is that we actually see significantly higher activity uh, of HDAC1 in deacetylating the protein substrates. This is similar to what we saw with HDAC8. However, all of the E. coli enzyme and the insect wild type enzyme still had significantly lower activity than the recombinantly purchased enzyme. So a next question was um, whether or not this was in fact due to the meeting protein, protein complexes to activate the activity. So we then reconstituted the, the HDAC1 co-rest LSD1 complex um, using both wild type, the phosphomimetic, and the E. coli enzymes. And when we incorporated, um, incubated HDAC with LSD1 and co-rest, we were able to then uh, show that in each case, we were able to form a complex between co-rest, LSD1, and HDAC. So once we formed that complex, we were then interested in looking at the activity. So this slide shows that um, we had very low activity with HDAC1. This is in fact using the insect HDAC1 with um, our peptide substrates. Um, we did not see an increase in activity for either uh, adding LSD1 or CoRest alone. But when we added the LSD, the preformed LSD1 CoRest complex, we now start to see activity that is comparable to the commercially available enzyme. And so HDAC1 was only enhanced in the presence of the LSD1 CoRest complex. Uh, and so this was for peptides. We then also wanted to look at whether or not um, we saw an increased activity with proteins. And in fact, the answer is yes, that um, with the insect enzyme, we actually see uh, activity that's comparable or better than the commercial enzyme. Uh, we also see with the E. coli enzyme that uh, in two cases with the H3K9 acetylated and H3K14, we saw comparable activity, although the E. coli enzyme did not catalyze deacetylation of the H3K23 acetylated. And um, this suggests that um, the different constructs display differences in specific site activation, and it could very well be due to phosphorylation. Um, so in summary, what I've told you about HDAC selectivity is that the activity and substrate selectivity of HDAC are determined and modulated by a number of factors. We've demonstrated that the primary amino acid sequence is an important determinant of HDAC8 selectivity. 
we've demonstrated that long range protein protein interactions are important for selectivity and activity for both HDAC1 and HDAC8. And we've demonstrated that post translational modifications um, can affect the selectivity and reactivity of these enzymes. Um, we've shown that phosphorylation affects both the selectivity for HDAC1 and HDAC8. Finally, we've shown that with HDAC1, the protein complexes have an enormous effect on activity. We have, essentially, we go from low activity to very high activity when we form the CoRes complex. And uh, it will be interesting to continue to look at how various complexes affect the um, selectivity of um, HDAC1 and also other HDAC enzymes. So with that, I'd like to finally thank everybody who actually did this work. So in particular, I'd like to thank Jeff Lopez, who along with Brent Martin's group did the substrate um, capture work, uh, which I think has really helped us understand which proteins HDAC8 could, could be uh, de catalyzing deacetylation. And then I'd also like to recognize Kelsey Diffley, who um, was my last Michigan graduate student. And she really started the work with HDAC1 and has finished that work. Um, I would also like to thank uh, my collaborator, collaborators, Milan Merksic, David Christensen, Ora Furman Schulman, Andy Andrews, and um, also funding from NIH and the Welch Foundation. And with that, I'd really like to thank you very much for listening to my talk. And I am also very honored to uh, receive the Mildred Cohn Award in biological chemistry. So thank you very much.